to what are, I suppose, conventional views of the way in which the March of Wales and Wales itself work. The, the book deals with a family who are upwardly mobile over the course of some two centuries. They start off, as far as I can see, by being relatively low level members of what I'll call a, a, a sort of minor official class in the march. The lords in general in the march were of Anglo-Norman or English descent, but they couldn't control their very, very extensive territories. And remember that eventually the March of Wales will encompass rather more than half of the totality of Wales. It's a big place. Uh, it needs a lot of administration. It needs to be um, controlled. It needs, it needs to be a, a source of profit. That's often what March of Lords are all about. They're all about profit. Um, and they talk about their lordships in terms of their capacity to enlist people and their support, but above all, in their capacity to raise money. Um, in order to do that, Marcher Lords, Anglo, Norman, or English Marcher Lords need to be able to communicate with their Welsh tenantry and they need therefore Welsh officials to do that. We can see the way that things are going when we find, for example, in what seems to be the 14th century, the early 14th century, um, a translation of the great treatise that was commonly used in England as a guide to estate management. And I'm talking about Walter of Henley's husbandry. We find a translation into Welsh. Uh, we can see that there is that perceived need uh, in order to maximize revenue and to maximize control and to maximize good practice in the agricultural development of the march, there is a need uh, for a very strong Welsh element. Of course, it's inevitable. Up until the later years, all real, well, really, may, maybe the early years of the 13th century, later years of the 12th, early years of the 13th century, um, whenever we see uh, important gatherings of officials and significant folk in the march, perhaps they've been gathered together to act as witnesses to a deed that is being issued by uh, one of the march lords, uh, perhaps they're being consulted in some way by one of the March of Lords. Uh, in, in the late 12th century, in the early 13th century, we will find hardly a single example of a strong Welsh presence in such a meeting. They'll all have Anglo-Norman names. They all have English names. That begins to change in the early years of the 13th century. It, it seems to me that it changes nowhere as rapidly as it does in the case of the Mortimer family. Um, I'm not just saying that because we're here, at least in part under the auspices of the Mortimer History Society. Uh, I'm saying it because it's a fact that the first time, the first times you see um, tenantry, Welsh tenantry being brought into what are described as a, a marcher administration. It's in the Mortimer territories. Um, the, the development after that is that increasing numbers of Welsh people are to be found in the administration of the march and they're to be found step by step moving into the higher echelons of that administration. The family I've dealt with in this book are, are one such family and they're actually probably the, the first of the really important families who make a name and a place for themselves in the administration of, um, of marcher lordships. And this family were pretty versatile. They didn't stick with one marcher lordship. They infiltrated several and they became prominent in several. 
Um, but in so doing, they begin, you know, to um, erode confidence on the part of modern scholars, or at least I hope they do, because they begin to cut across cliche renderings of what was the position, what was the place of the Welsh community in the 12th and in particular in the 13th centuries. The, the conventional view, if I can put it with a degree of oversimplification for which I apologize to those who know all about this stuff, but let, let, me, let me oversimplify. Uh, the, the traditional view is, I suppose, that the position of the Welsh in the march is to be the underdogs. It is to be the dog's bodies. It is to be bossed around. It is to be victimized. Uh, it is not to have uh, a significant hope for the future other than the simple hope for mere survival. That implicitly does damage to the names and to the aspirations of a great many Welsh figures who are certainly not content with that kind of underdog's role. Um, increasingly in the 13th century, what we see is the advance of the Welsh population in the march, and in particular with sections of that Welsh population who become very closely associated with the governance of the marcher lordships. Um, even, even my old supervisor, doctoral level, and my, my own hero in so much of the study of Wales and the March, and I'm talking about the late Professor Sir Rhys Davies, even Rhys, would take some degree of delight, even satisfaction, in pointing out that the holders of serious senior offices within the March land, particularly in the 14th century, tended not to be Welsh. You would occasionally find a Welsh steward, a Welsh receiver, and so on. But in general, you're looking at uh, a not a monopoly of office, but a very significant role in office exercised by English, by people of Anglo-Norman descent. I think to a significant degree, Rhys was missing the point, and, and, it's, and it's very rarely that I ever get to say such a thing, and it doesn't give me any pleasure to say it. But I think he was missing a point, and it's a point that has been borne in on me in recent work that I've been doing, including on this book. And that is that if we simply look at the, the people who held a nominal office under marcher lords, we will get Anglo-Norman names. But these people are not the totality by any means of the power and patronage structures of the march. Increasingly, as we go through the 13th century, we realize that there's a sort of network, a social network uh, in marcher lordships, which is essentially Welsh, and where you have people who may not hold formal office, but who are nevertheless the movers and shakers of the marcher lordships. Occasionally they do hold office, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Below that, there is the bulk of the iceberg, which is the fact that a dominant faction within the upper ranks, and I'm talking about social rather than official ranks, within the upper social ranks of the Lordship, we find that there are many, many Welsh people. And to write them off as the underdogs is to do a significant disservice to them, and it's also to do a significant disservice to the, the truth of the matter which is what we're all engaged in trying to establish. It's about time, I think, that people in Wales who are committed to the future of Wales began to learn 
about the past of Wales, and I mean, in this case, the deep past, the medieval past, in many ways, the formative past. And it is a story which, in which we can find plenty of oppression. I'm not denying that. And it's not a pretty sight when we find it, but it's also a story of relentless advance an advance that will eventually lead to the people of Wales taking over the initiative and the governance and the influence and the control of Wales itself. There is a terrific narrative. There is a terrific story which has yet to be told in anything like its full glory. And I think that's one of the things that perhaps I hope I'm just starting to do in this present book because it does tell a story of a family who rise and rise and rise. They take some strange turns in the process, but they are lighting a path for their fellow nationals. And that path will be taken up, it will be followed. And I think it's a very important point to make. Um, so that historiographically, we are, I hope, emerging from a tradition of lament at oppression into an age of rejoicing in progress and the establishment of what is, in truth, a Welsh Wales. In more prosaic terms, um, I really need, I guess, to discuss how the book develops, how it developed, um, what, what, the, what the future lies for similar studies. Um, the, the, the book emerged from my work on the 13th century, in which the, the, the man who was really responsible for launching the dynasty on a, on a path towards power and fame. And his name was Howell Ap Meyrig. And he is a, a man, a Welsh man of the march. Um, he emerges eventually as a, a, a man described in 1277 as the steward of Roger Mortimer, of the steward of Humphrey de Boone, the Earl of Hereford and the Lord of Brecon, and the steward of the King of England, Edward I. In other words, he was a senior officer of three great lords, two March lords and one King of England. Um, that is a, a bit of a shock if you are used to uh, being made aware that there was no room for Welsh people in the Welsh March. The circumstance in which Howell Ap Meyrig became, came to be known by those titles of steward of this, steward of that, steward of, was that he was leading uh, an army out of mid Wales um, in the course of the war of 1277 on the part of Edward I against Llewellyn Af Griffith, Prince of Wales. A war that I guess you all know, um, Llewellyn was not to win. He was not to win it in part because by his actions, by his governance, he had alienated many people in many parts of Wales and Howell Ap Meyrig was one of them. And so we pick him up in that 1277 document, leading a force of 2,700 soldiers, um, of whom I can be fairly sure that the great majority were Welsh and the great majority of the 27 commanders who are noted in the document, 20 of them were Welshmen and they were following Howell Ap Meyrig. And so when you find something like that, you have to start uh, as, as a, a, basically a, a, a historian, you have to start asking the question, who on earth is this guy? Who is this Howell Ap Meyrig? And you trace him back. You trace him back to what I'm fairly convinced is a forged or a fake, if you like, no, a forged pedigree that's probably forged significantly later, 
it, it could be any time after the early 14th century, um, which traces his descent from uh, basically the Lord Fries, uh, the ruler of Dehebath, the southwestern zone of Wales uh, in the 12th century. Uh, I profoundly believe that that genealogy is false and that it's a concoction in order to, as they say, big up the family that Hawala Meirik had left behind him. Uh, his real ancestry seems to be more prosaic. Uh, they seem to be um, minor officials um, in the little lordship of Gladestree in the March. Um, and they end up as, as, I, as I got interested in this man and I started to follow his deeds and I found him all over the place eventually. He was ubiquitous um, and he was a survivor. He lived dangerously. He lived, for example, in the castle of Kevin Fies, which was a, a Mortimer castle. And he lived there in the early 1260s when it was captured by a group of the inhabitants of the Kantrev in which it lay, the Kantrev of Melian Nif. Uh, and he, his, his gatekeepers were killed. He could so easily have been killed, but he survived and his wife and children survived. And they lived to fight and breed, I suspect, another day. He lived dangerously when he was able to get close enough to Llewellyn the Last's new castle at Dolvorin, now near Newtown. In those days, it wasn't near Newtown because Newtown hadn't arrived. Um, and at Dolvorin, he learned, or near to Dolvorin, he, he learned of Llewellyn's plans. He learned of how his stay in his new castle had been organized, uh, how the refreshments were being organized, or what was going to take place. Uh, he, he learned how Llewellyn was uh, rumored to be going to go off and look for another castle in the forest of Clun. And I think we now know what that castle was and it's dead right, that's what he was going to do. How Olaf Meirig was reporting all this to his patrons in the Mortimer family and the Mortimer administration. And he was warning them to keep a good lookout because he wasn't sure whether things he'd heard about meetings between Llewellyn and some of the great men of England were for good or for evil. He lived dangerously and he survived and he prospered and he eventually became a figure of great repute in not just the Marchland, but in other contexts. Here is one of the very first Welshmen to bear a coat of arms. That's what's on the front of the book. Uh, that's the coat of arms as described in St. George's Roll, uh, a roll of arms which has very close and obvious associations with the Mortimer family. And it's a roll of the later part of the 13th century, uh, and it includes a very few Welshmen in it, and one of them is Hawlaf Meirig. He's got a coat of arms, and we have pretty good evidence that he was knighted by the king, by e Edward I. Um, he therefore survives to be someone of great dignity and of great importance, and someone who is very well known, way beyond the Marchland. He'd already begun to make an impression in his own person, in his own right, in territories beyond the march. And indeed, this whole family gave me one hell of a headache when it came to trying to choose a title for the book. Because although it was clear that the march was crucial to their development, they had a sort of, over two centuries, they developed something like a tentacular sort of capacity. They, they got everywhere until in the end, um, they're very important in the administration of the Principality of Wales, the royal lands in Wales. They were crucially important in the Southern Principality, um, based 
in the towns of Cardigan and Carmarthen, but also going right out into the communities of those towns beyond them, their hinterlands. Um, we find the, the first Welshman to be Justice of South Wales. He's a descendant of Howell Ap Meirig. He's one of the family. That's extraordinary. Um, we find that, uh, that they are everywhere in the administration of South Wales. And then suddenly at a point, it ceases to be enough. And they move into England. They move into Herefordshire first, and they become members of parliament for Herefordshire, sheriffs of Herefordshire, you know, senior officials. Nothing could stop these guys from being on the rise. And subsequently, I won't, I won't tell you everything because otherwise, if you've already bought a book, you'll send it back because you'll have heard it. Um, but uh, I, I'm only scratching the surface, I promise you. Um, eventually, members of this family will become members of the English court. They will significantly, but not totally, leave Wales behind them. And they will anglicise to a very significant degree. Uh, again, um, one might think, well, they should have really um, devoted all their energies to their homeland, to its development. But you can understand that the glamour and the glitz and the money were close to the English court. And so we find members of the family high up in the court of Richard II, for example, they're, they're high ranking courtiers, they are king's knights. And starting with Howell Ap Meirig and running right to the end of the line for the family in the early part of the 15th century, an awful lot of these guys are knighted. Um, there, once again, there's a sort of historiographic error. Um, people say with great delight that you, you don't really find Welsh knights. Well, actually, in the course of following this family of knights, I found lots of other Welsh knights. It, it's simply something where we've got to break through the old narratives and construct a new one, which is a new one of driving success in so many cases. There are other things as well, you know, um, when, when I talk about patronage, and this is an area which I wish I could develop more in the book, but I am struggling against a certain lack of evidence. But I can make some educated guesses now in a very confidential environment where we've only got about 90 people present. Um, alongside official posts, and the absence in many parts of the march of a sustained Welsh presence in those, in those official posts, we have another form of power which gives rise to patronage, and that is social power. Welsh families become socially important in the march, as they do, of course, in Purawalia, in pure Wales, the Welsh principalities are under. English kings to the West. And social power means that you call the shots. It means that decisions by formally appointed servants of marcher lords are not going to be made until they have discussed the issue with those who hold social power. Because those who hold social power hold in their hands the will and the goodwill of the Welsh community in the march. If those who hold social power instruct the community to be obstructive, the community will be obstructive. If they instruct the community to behave well and in a positive way towards the formal structures of control, then the community will do that and everyone will get along the better for it. There's, um, in, in the area of my own traditional interest, and that is to say the, the land of Powys, 
in its various manifestations and its various shapes, and we're still fiddling with those. There is a tract, uh, a sort of legal tract, which I think is to be dated uh, 1422. It's, uh, it's 12 years or so since the last male member of this family in this book died. The line ran out in the male line with him. But this tract is from 1422, it's 12 years on, and it starts with a ringing declaration that the most important position, the most important person in a, in a lordship was the Penkenedl. Now that's the chief of kindred, and it's not a governmental office in the conventional sense. The, the march a lord does not appoint a penkendal. The, the folk do, the kin do. And the writer of this tract is in no doubt, this is the important office. This is the most important office. And in other words, the chief of the major kindred group within the lordship. If that's anything like the truth, and I do believe that it's very significantly the truth, it gives us an entree into that world of social dominance, which runs parallel with official dominance. The one can't do without the other. And in that sense, I go back to what I said a few minutes ago, in that sense, Rhys Davies got it wrong when he ascribed the weakness of the Welsh in the march to their low numbers in the official positions of march or lordships. He was unusually for Rhys, for whom realities usually mattered a lot more than the names which were used to describe reality, and the realities may not have names. And in this case, in general, they didn't, because we're talking about social dominance rather than official nominal dominance. And that's one of the things that I think I can begin to just scratch the surface of in this book. Uh, you get glimpses of people who exercised power beyond their nominal rank. And they did it because of who they were and who their family was. And this is a classic example of a family that, if you like, punched above its nominal weight. So there are dimensions to the whole way in which we look at history, which we can draw out of this book and other work that I'm involved in producing. Uh, and I hope that in the process, I may well be uh, at some point talking to Xi'an again. But we're looking at something which is little short of a revolution in which we countenance medieval Wales. Um, it, 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 gives us, it gives us a different narrative. And with that word narrative, again, I want to just stop and make a point. There has been a tendency, and I will call it an academic tendency, and it's a perfectly honourable one, to think that the way we must write history is by a deeper and deeper analytical framework. We analyze, we analyze. And for those who say, yeah, but what about a good old story? There is and has been simply a scornful response. Well, anybody can do that. That's simple. Um, and it's shallow. Storytelling is facile, detailed, stiflingly detailed analysis is clever and it's academic and it's what you've got to do. Well, I'm beginning to disagree. And I'm beginning to think that there's a lot more in straightforward storytelling than meets the eye. And that's because storytelling actually is usually, if you're trying to do it seriously, it's anything but straightforward. It leads to to get in touch with what we would describe today as realism, the realism of the society in which we live. And we have 
enough of a difficulty, I think, trying to establish the narrative without wanting to go too deeply into the analysis in terms of our everyday lives. And we live our everyday lives in a complex fashion. And so this book started in some way as an experiment, which I was ready to abandon at any point. An, an experiment in narrative, in narrative history, something that has been despised, particularly in the academic community. It's been the mark of popularism, you know, just, just being popular for the sake of it. Uh, it's been the mark of someone who, if you like, just wants to sell books without saying anything serious. Well, that's something that I think I've learned is not really a correct way of approaching the way we write history. Um, this book, I think I, I think I intimated this earlier when I started to speak. Um, this book, which is essentially, as it says on the title of the book, it is a story. It's one family's story. And trying to establish that story really drained me for not, not occasionally, but for weeks, for months, I would say for the best part of a couple of years. And it did so because it, it, it brought me face to face with the need to establish the truth. And because this family left no family papers, there is no cache of family papers. There is no archive into which I can dip easily uh, in order to find out the truth about how the family went forward. This is one protracted narrative, which is derived from the hunting for needles in haystacks, looking for the odd fact in a pile of evidence where you have no hope of finding it, but suddenly, after all those hours or after those days or sometimes after those weeks, you find it, you find something that just illuminates the story, it adds to the detail. And it, that's been the, the way of putting all this together. Um, it's been needle in a haystack stuff. And my word, it's been worth it because it has pulled this family back from oblivion in, in many cases and put them right in the forefront of some very stirring events, which you'll find, I think, if you, if you do engage in, 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 in with the book. Um, and I hope you will. Um, the, the, the book and the, and the family, they, they tell us things, you know, about the, the, the Marchland. They tell us that the Marchland was, uh, of course, ethnically a complex place. Um, we, we must at times begin to wonder how uh, a, a family of Welshmen of mediocre estate suddenly find themsel themselves in the company of the Knights of the Marchland, the Anglo-Norman Knights of the Marchland, and then in the company of the marcher lords themselves. And indeed, one branch of the family becomes part of the fabric of marcher lordship. They become lords of the march in their own right. A very, a very rare thing. Although perhaps we're going to find in the future, not quite as rare as we have been led to believe. The answer in the case of this family is constant application. They were constantly ambitious. They constantly seized what opportunities came their way. And they therefore constantly succeeded from one stage of their ascent into the upper ranks of society to another. And it was just this assiduous taking of chances, putting themselves in danger. Oh yes, they, this, there are members of this family who have known the inside of the Tower of London, and that often led to the ax or to the sword, and they've done it and they've got out of it. Sometimes more by luck than judgment, but they've done it. They have known what it is to be suspected and followed around and to, if you like, have 
surveillance brought to bear upon you. And, and they've persevered until they've shaken off their pursuers, if you like. It has been their constant striving that has been impressive. And, which, and it was this that took me from being prepared to abandon the project at any point to being committed to seeing it through. Because in the end, they turned out to be such a worthwhile group of people to study, such, in some ways, such an inspiring group, um, and such an exciting group for people who end up not just as courtiers of Richard II, or for that matter, of the man who supplanted him, Henry IV, um, because they went seamlessly from one to the other. They were like that. But they also became uh, diplomatic figures, ambassadors, if you like, uh, at the highest level, ranging through Europe, making contacts, acquiring, for example, a bride for Richard II in Bohemia. So their, their bounds were ex extending, they were expanding, they were becoming somebody in a European context. And so they became crusaders. They, they became crusaders in Tunis. They became tourists, where one of them died, just outside Constantinople. These became people of a European vision and a European presence. And so again, the, the upward movement was still going on. And gosh, if they had not died out in 1410 in the mail line, where would they have stopped? Because they were still going up. And one of them, of course, had the privilege of being captured by Glendur's men after the Battle of Brynglas, the Battle of Pileth. He was the one, however, who uh, got out and was returned to his family, presumably because they'd paid him, they'd paid the ransom for him. But uh, again, you can see that um, even being brought face to face with Owain Glyndwr was another aspect of the growing ascendancy and the upward mobility of this family. Um, those are some of the things that I've found really interesting about them while writing. I've found them sometimes devilishly difficult to trace, but I think that, I, I hope, I've, I've done an awful lot of the tracing. There will be people who will come after this book and who will add bits to it, uh, and, and therefore maybe, you know, in second editions, whatever, third editions in the future, maybe uh, it, it'll be possible to, add a few things that people have found subsequent to um, what's in the book. Uh, I, I have to say to my own personal shame that after the book had been finally handed over for printing, I found one more document <laughs> that I really should have put in it and I hadn't, I hadn't happened upon it. So now it's lodged in my memory. There'll be others, I'm quite sure. Um, but that's the nature of the game we play, particularly as medievalists we're stumbling across upon stuff all the time. Finally, um, before I run out of Mo Lloyd's prescribed time, I just thought I would name the lady in question. Um, but before I do that, um, just a word on the question of, well, what does the book in the final analysis achieve? I hope it's a good read. I hope it sheds a, a light on the way in which things were over the course of two centuries in the march, and it's not the way we have historically thought them to have gone. This is the beginning of new narrative, as far as the march is concerned, uh, in certain respects. Um, I wish I'd been able to write more about the women of the family because what I have found is impressive. In one or two cases, it's very impressive and they were obviously a great force, but without, short of making it up, which I don't do, I couldn't 
find that much to write. But I, again, that's one of the areas where I hope that there will be help and there will be uh, replacements of what I've done. And those will take place over time. And I, for one, will welcome them. Beyond that, what this book may achieve is the start of something. It's, it, it may, and I, and I can't keep the hope out of my voice, it may be uh, the start of a sort of domino effect. Um, it, it was Rhys Davies again, who, um, as was his overwhelming wont, got it absolutely right. I've criticized one thing he said um, in all the books that he wrote. And in one of those books, he wrote that it, it was very difficult to get to grips with the families, the leading families of the march, uh, and in particular the Welsh ones, that uh, as they began to develop, they were very hard to track down, um, but that he thought that there might be some gain in individual family studies. Well, what I've just written is an individual family study. I, I didn't write it in the knowledge of what Reese had said. I stumbled on what Reese said when I was halfway through. It was both an encouragement, and I've said in the book, it's a kind of justification in that uh, it's a start to individual family studies. Once we've got a dozen or two family studies done and published in journals, or in book form, if they're long enough, then we can begin putting them together. I could draw up a list today, and I could do it for those who want to do it down the email um, in the following days. But once we've got a number of families and we can see how they develop, some of them Welsh, some of them Cambro Norman. Anglo-Welsh, call it what you will, but the result of a mixture. Then we shall begin to have new light to shine on the march, which I think, and I hope it's revealed in this book, is one of the most complex, but also one of the most rewarding places to study in the whole of medieval Europe. And with that, before I get told off by Mo Lloyd, I'm going to bring this stage of things to an end and I'm going to pass over, if Philip is still with us, I'm going to pass back over to Philip. So if that's all right, I'll shut up and Philip will reappear. As if by magic, he's done as it. If, as if by magic, David. Uh, okay, right. As we discussed, we can give Mo 15 seconds. <laughs> and then, and then I'll, 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 well, I'll tell you when Mo's gone and then you can start again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I've got another two hours to go now. 